Welcome. This is Alexia Hudson Ward, Editor in Chief of Toward Inclusive Excellence, or TIE for short, a multimedia blog hosted by Choice, a publishing unit of the Association of College and Research Libraries, a division of the American Library Association. We explore issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion that affect the higher education community. Among the goals of this channel is the development of a pool of knowledge and actionable resources for information professionals, undergraduates, faculty, staff, and administrators seeking to understand racism from new perspectives and to promote racial justice on their campuses. We are excited to welcome you to our podcast series that borrows its name from the Higher Education Academic Calendar. Therefore, you're listening to Ty's Summer Session. This summer session features a compelling interview with Stephen S. Rogers, retired Harvard Business School professor and the author of A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues, What You Can Do Right Now to Help the Black Community, released this year by Wiley Publishing. In our conversation, Stephen urges us to think of beyond our comfort zones about how to best address America's racial wealth gap in quite a compelling fashion. Moreover, his charge to white people is clear and direct on how to move beyond performative allyship. And now to our conversation with Stephen S. Rogers. Hello everyone, this is Alexia Hudson Ward, Editor-in-Chief of Toward Inclusive Excellence, a partnership with ALA Choice Publishing. This is our first summer session podcast, and I'm so excited to have Stephen S. Rogers, who is the author of A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues, What You Can Do Right Now to Help the Black Community, have this great conversation with us. So several of you all will remember that we had a really wonderful interview that was posted with Stephen on the Thai blog. And so this is a continuation of this conversation. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. Alexi, thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed the previous session that we did, and I'm looking forward to this one. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And so I'm going to jump right into the questions because they're all, you know, hot questions. So this is going to be a great conversation. Um, So my first question is on the matter of reparations for Black Americans. And Stephen, this remains a provocative and sometimes really heated topic. Would you share with us why you believe it's important for Black Americans to receive reparations from the United States government? You know, first of all, the topic of reparations is always seemingly a heated topic when the uh, Jews rightfully received reparations from Germany as a result of being put in concentration camps and and what happened at the the concentration camps. The German population, for the most part, was vehemently against it. Violence broke out, and despite the violence breaking out, um, the government decided to do the right thing. And so it's always, reparations always has some of these aspects to it. And, and I encourage people to embrace reparations with the spirit of former President Kennedy, who said, we don't go to the moon because it's easy. We go because it's hard. And I say mm-hmm. the same relative to reparations. We shouldn't pursue it simply because it's easy. It is going to be hard, but that's all right. And my argument for reparation goes back to slavery. And America has never paid reparations to Black Americans uh, for 246 years of slavery, followed by 60 years of Black codes and vacancy laws, followed by 40 years of red linings. All of these things, Alexi, were, were intentionally done by the federal and state governments to enrich white people, while at the same time it was done to impoverish Black people. Um, that 246 years of slavery was in essence 12 generations of transference of wealth from white white family to white family. Whereas at the same time during that same period, 
zero was transferred by most black families. And there's an activist who cites the fact that the whole idea of transferring that wealth was something akin to blacks and whites playing a game of monopoly, where mm. every time the black person won, the black person had to give his or her winnings to the white opponent. And that's exactly what happened to black people, that in essence, the government create a socialist program for whites when they um, sanctioned slavery. And it was a socialist program to enrich whites while at the same time, as I stated, to almost bankrupt blacks. And the result is that today, blacks are an impoverished race. The great scholar W.E.B. Du Bois from Harvard said, it's horrible to be an impoverished person, but it's even worse to be an impoverished race. Mm -hmm. We are indeed an impoverished race because 35% of all black people have zero net worth. And the reason why we have that kind of problem is because of that 246 years of slavery, followed by over 100 years of continued discrimination against us, all of which was focused on finance, enriching whites and impoverishing blacks. So today the result is um, the average black family, excuse me, average white family has a net worth of over 200, excuse me, $170,000 compared to only 17,000 for the average black family. So you have this disparity to the tune of about $153,000. And Alexi, there is nothing that black people can do to catch up. We can't save. We, if every black person spent all of their money with a black owned business, we still would never catch up because that 246 years was a phenomenal head start in economic and financial security that was given by the government. So we can never catch up because we have been given, whites were given um, an advantage. They were given a head start. So it is my position that the only way that black people can catch up is by the federal government actually giving reparations to blacks. I believe that over 50% of the black problems or the problems between blacks and whites today, the foundation of those problems is this wealth disparity. And the wealth disparity was created by the federal government. And in fact, the federal government was great and they did a phenomenal job. They were very successful in creating this wealth disparity. Um, with the redlining, the black codes, and then 246 years of slavery. And slavery in terms of, excuse me, in terms of reparations, reparations have been a thing that has some precedence in the United States, precedent in the United States. The United States actually gave uh, reparations to Japanese Americans. You know, during World War II, America felt that the Japanese Americans, they were uh, questioning their loyalty. So they imprison them. They put them in internment camps for three years. It was 120 Japanese Americans that they put into these internment camps for three years. They did not do the same with German or Italian people, Americans, um, because they said that we're fighting um, Japan. Mm -hmm. And so we don't trust the Japanese. And so they did not say we don't trust the white uh, Italian uh, Americans of uh, Italian descent, nor do we not trust the Americans of German descent. Both countries, we were fighting them as well. So they were interned for three years um, under the Reagan administration in 1988. He actually gave reparations to Japanese Americans, 80,000 Japanese Americans who had been interned, and he gave them a check of $20,000 each. So there's precedent in America given reparations. Also, amazingly, there's precedent with slavery, and that is reparations by the federal government were given to over 900 slave owners Ooh. after Blacks were emancipated with the 13th Amendment. It was exactly 979 uh, white slave owners who received checks to the tune of $300 for every one of the 2,989 slaves that they had. So whites actually received reparations by the federal government, and in fact, if you look at the Emancipation Proclamation and you listen to what Lincoln, President Lincoln, in his speeches, what he was saying to the Confederates as he was trying to lure them back into the Union, he was always promising them some type of reparations program um, to compensate them for the loss of slaves if they would just simply come back to the Union. It never mm -hmm. happened. 
-hmm. So we have this history in the United States of reparations. And Alexi, we also have it worldwide. In the UK, um, the United Kingdom, slavery was abolished in 1843. And when slavery was abolished, the United Kingdom, which had all of the colonies um, throughout the world, they decided to compensate again the white slave owners for losing their slaves. And they took financing in the form of debt, the federal government did, and they paid these former slave owners, they paid them 20 million pounds, which is today equivalent to over 16 billion pounds. Mm. And the most fascinating thing about that, Alexi, is that to, uh, the, the payment for that debt, the final payment came in 2015. So you had black Brits who were paying white slave owners for the enslavement of their ancestors in essence, in terms of those reparations. So I am a ardent supporter of reparations being paid to black people. It has never happened. The closest we ever got to black people receiving any kind of reparations was after General William Sherman. He was marching through Savannah, Georgia with the Union troops after they were defeating the Confederates. And it was, as he was marching through Savannah, Georgia in 1865, Black people were leaving the plantations. And they were leaving the plantations and following the Union soldiers as they were defeating the Confederates. And William Sherman, General William Sherman, sent a letter to um, the president. He said to President Lincoln, he said, we have people following us. What should we do with all of these people? And President Lincoln wrote back, and I quote him, ask the Negroes, what do they want? And so General Sherman met with 20 black clergymen. Many of them had been formerly enslaved. Some had been free men all of their lives, but he met with 20 black clergymen and he asked them, what is it that you want? And the black clergymen unanimously said, we want land. We want land so that we can take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then he asked the question, he said, do you want the land and live amongst whites or do you want it separate? And it was not unanimous, but the majority of the clergymen said, we want land separately because we can never trust whites to treat us respectfully with dignity and fairly. Um, so General Sherman after that issued special order number 15. And special order number 15 said, the federal government of the United States was going to take 400,000 acres of land that was formerly owned by Confederate soldiers. And they were gonna take this land from them because they were gonna try the Confederate soldiers for treason, for what they had done. They were gonna hang most of them. And they said, we're gonna try them for treason, we're taking this land, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna give this land to black families in plots of 40 acres at a cost of $1.25 an acre. So they actually implemented special order number 15 and they gave 40,000 acres to black folks um, at $1.25 an acre, 40% down. But then President Lincoln gets murdered and when he gets murdered, Andrew Jackson replaces him. And when he replaces him, he's a former slave owner. When he replaces him, he rescinds special order number 15. He says it is unfair to white people to give Negroes this land. Let them work for the land. And then he pardons all of the Confederates and returns the 400,000 acres to them, including the 40,000 that had been previously given to Blacks. So what we see is there has never been any type of reparations given to Blacks for the work that was done that was never compensated for 246 years, followed by the federal government and state governments intentionally doing things and writing laws and implementing practices that intentionally had the objective of impoverishing black people while enriching white people. So that's my pitch for reparations. And it's my, my position finally, that as I stated earlier, black people cannot out, we cannot save ourselves out of this predicament. We cannot work ourselves out of this predicament what we know, Alexi, is we know that the average white person who is a high school dropout has a greater net worth than the average black person with a college degree. And we know that because, and the reason behind it is because, again, of that 246 year head start that the white community got from the federal government. 
And research shows, one scholar showed that if whites stopped amassing wealth right now and blacks continue to amass wealth at their present pace, it would take over 225 years for black people to catch up. That's not a surprise because we're talking about that 246 year head start that was in Involved with slaving, enslavement of black folks. So, yes, and I was going to say, you know, true to the tradition that we're trying to establish with summer session, you are really taking us to school. And I do have a couple of follow up questions as I was feverishly taking notes um, with a lot of your really excellent points. And so, if you don't mind, I want to pivot Please. to a couple of those follow up questions. So you quoted, yeah, you quoted W.B. Du Bois's impoverished race statement, a statement that, you know, some people on, you know, of all ethnicities kind of take issue with because, you know, there is this kind of common thinking that, you know, black people are doing well, you know, in air quotes, well, you know, a la one can live wherever they want to live. Um, oftentimes our enjoyment of luxury brands is brought into the fold of this conversation. And, you know, and some people are just kind of feeling like, you know, impoverished race is very strong, you know, to suggest that. But then you weaved in the difference between white net worth and black net worth. So can you talk a little more about that to the audience around, you know, this disparity between white wealth and black wealth from a net worth perspective? Yeah, um, as I cited, the average net worth of a white perk family in America is $170,000 compared to a mere 17,000 for blacks. So that's a, a, the white net worth is 10 times greater than the black net worth, which means when we talk about the net worth is, you know, assets minus any kind of liabilities gives you your net worth. So yes. whites have all of this money and this capital and this assets available to live a different quality kind of life than blacks do. What we know is with wealth, and that's essentially what whites have, with wealth comes better health care, with wealth comes lower po uh, poverty, excuse me, with mm. wealth comes lower crime. Um, mm -hmm. that the symptoms of poverty, all of the, the, the negative things that we see that are synonymous typically with the black community, that we're not a bad community, we just are a poor community. And the things that we see are the result of being impoverished. And you know, we look at that wealth disparity and you look at Boston, you're in Boston with MIT and I was there with Harvard Business School. The Boston Globe did a story about uh, black and white racial issues. And I think yeah. it was about three years ago. And what they found was amazingly that the average net worth of a white family in Boston was two hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars. Okay, mm -hmm. compared to the average net worth of a black family in Boston being only eight dollars, right. a mere eight dollars. I did not say eighty dollars. I did not say eight hundred dollars. I did not say eight thousand dollars. Eight dollars. So this goes to the heart of what has happened to black people and what has happened to white people, and that is this phenomenal head start that has happened for white people that was sanctioned by the federal government, that has enriched them, that has put money in their coffers, that has put money in their bank accounts, put money um, and made, them, made money available to them to buy homes. These things are not available to Blacks. And the result of it, this low net worth, for example, that Blacks have the lowest percentage of home ownership than any other race or ethnic group in this country. We just don't have yes. any money. And as I stated earlier, it's 35% of us have zero net worth. And I come from a family. My parents were that um, in that category in terms of zero net worth. Um, and my life is changing now. But the reality is we do not, whatever we see on TV about conspicuous consumption, that's an anomaly. Those are the few Black people who do have something. Most of us don't have any kind of net worth whatsoever. And the result is... We live day to day. We live with the hope that nothing drastic happens to our lives, such that we can end up being, for example, homeless as a result of it. But all of that has a legacy going back to slavery, where things were done intentionally to help whites while they were. And I always say this, 
the government's rules and policies were not done just to be mean to Black people. If you go back, what you'll always find is it was for financial gain. It was to right. make sure that Black people didn't get any financial means as well as contrastingly to make sure that whites got that benefit. So that net worth is a huge determinant of one's quality of life. And we can never catch up unless the federal government does for us the same as what they did for the white community. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that explanation, because I think that, you know, at least for our audience, for Ty, there'll definitely, you know, be some um, lack of clarity around money spent versus net worth. You know, and I think a lot of Americans get that confused, you know, is that net worth is what you have after you have acquired assets. And, you know, when all your bills are paid, like kind of like what you have left over um, and, and how that is really transformational in terms of one's well-being. So thank you so much for that explanation. The other follow-up question I have for you on this matter, Stephen, is related to what I call the Jacksonian rationale for not giving excuses. And I appreciate you raising Andrew, President Andrew Jackson, um, you know, rescinding the 40 acres and a mule reparation agreement, you know, but then also saying, you know, Black people should work for it, et cetera, et cetera. So even in 2021, you know, we have um, a lot of white people who say, you know, well, I shouldn't be held responsible for what my ancestors did. You know, I shouldn't have to or this government shouldn't have to pay into a circumstance that none of us live through. What are some of the ways in which we can have more fruitful conversations with our white colleagues on these really important topics? Great question. Um, you know, we live in a society. First of all, people talk about things that happened over 100 plus years ago that they're not responsible for that and they should not be held responsible for it. What I would say in the kindest way that I can put that is that's an extraordinarily selfish way to look mm. at history. It is impractical um, in the sense that what happened over a hundred plus years ago, for example, is today the way that we govern this country. And our constitution was written over a hundred plus years ago. And People are the beneficiaries of the writings of that constitution. And what we know is, we know that our laws and our judicial system is one that says, when people are harmed, there's reparations that need to be paid to them. And it doesn't matter, for example, if a, if a drug pusher sells drugs successfully and then gives the money to his parents and his children and everything, our laws will go back and take all of that from them, okay? because they were not entitled to it. And therefore, this whole notion of things happening in the past and, there, and, and you not being responsible today is an absolute misnomer. If you bought a piece of real estate today and it had water bills dating mm. back for 50 years, but the previous owner never paid those water bills, if you got that piece of property, you're liable for those water bills. So yes. the beauty of America comes this, that you cannot be have a mindset that this is a cafeteria style uh, country that we have. And you will only select to be the beneficiary of the good things that have happened to America, but you want nothing to do with the bad things that happened to America. That's just not fair. It is not, it's not practical. And it just does not fit with how we are to come become a better country if we're ever to address this problem that we have, and that is this wealth disparity. So you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, well, my parents were an immigrant and they just came or, um, you know, to the country. Why should they be responsible? Well, first of all, my only thought is that, first of all, I'm glad you were able to come to this great country and benefit from it. But when you came here, you also assume some of those liabilities of this country. You cannot shun that kind of responsibility. And I'm not asking anybody to open their personal wallets for reparations. I am proposing that that money would come from the federal government. It would come from mm -hmm. the Fe Federal Reserve. Um, I'm proposing that the federal government would give Black Americans 18 years or older who are descendants of formerly slaves a check for that difference between $170,000 and $17,000.
That would cost America $3 trillion, which is $1 trillion less than what America paid to bail out the banks. Our entire economy in America is about $21 trillion. America can afford to put this behind us by giving that money to Black Americans who are um, suffering as a result of decisions made. So my response to those who don't want to let the history and our past history be a part of the way that we look at today is that is impractical. We mm. today are completely governed by the Declaration of Independence, the, the Constitution of the United States. We're governed by these documents that were written over a hundred plus years ago and makes our country what it is today. And so to excuse history, to bring up history as a reason for not um, doing it with uh, the way that Black people were treated is disingenuous, it's unfair, and it is somewhat mean-spirited, quite frankly. Um, mm. Black Americans have given so much to this country and gotten so little back. There's nobody, no race, no ethnic group who has fought in more wars than the Black community in America. We fought in every single war that has ever been fought over here in the United States. We are extraordinary loyal people despite the fact that the federal government literally said that black people with the constitution would only be three fifths of a person, despite the fact in the 1930s, the federal government literally financed uh, the expansion of the economy of the country by guaranteeing mortgages, uh, 30 year mortgages for whites only. This is a document. This is not something that I'm making up that the federal government literally said we're only going to give 30 year mortgage guarantees for people who buy homes. And those yeah. homes were only supposed to be and only approved if they were white. The federal government literally said it will not do this for Negroes. This is not something that is implied. It was explicitly stated. And when we look at other groups, and I'll close off of this, when we look at other groups like Italians and Irish, where people will say, you know, they came over and they were discriminated against, but they were never discriminated against with federal government documents. The yeah. Irish, for example, um, excuse me, the Italians uh, created their own banks because the banks would not give money to Italians. So they created their own banks. One noted bank was the Bank of Italy. And so when the federal government in the 1930s said, we're going to create the 30-year mortgages and we're going to give guarantees, federal government guarantees behind these mortgages such that banks no longer have risk in giving mortgages, the Bank of Italy flooded the Italian community with mortgages. And bank mortgages, Alexi, are one of the most profitable securities that banks can give. At the same time, the federal government refused to provide mortgage guarantees to Black people. They refused to allow Black banks to give mortgages. And this was in writing. And the result was Black banks have suffered. The Black community has suffered. And that's why Black people don't own homes today um, compared to other races. And the Bank of Italy was able to prosper such that today, the Bank of Italy is the Bank of America. We mm -hmm. don't have a story like that in the Black history because the federal government intentionally denied opportunities for Blacks. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. This is, I know, going to be an ongoing discussion. Um, and there are, you know, there's a lot of pro and con, but I really do appreciate of all of these responses. And I do have another question for you. Sure. Which ties in somewhat with some of the points that you've made, which is around education. And so, as you know, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and of course, you know, some course design at the undergraduate level to assist people with so-called life skills. Some of these classes have been called like adulting 101, you know, and, and oftentimes financial literacy are among the skills that are most frequently requested. And so as I listen to you um, give your really amazing responses, you know, America's complicated history with banking and real estate and the stock market is often not explored in the general curriculum. And so what are your thoughts about teaching what you describe as financial apartheid as a part of the undergraduate financial literacy curriculum? Well, I, I'm a strong supporter of it. And one of the things, for example, um, that I'll cite as the reason why it needs to be taught is 
so that everybody can understand the financial circumstances that Black people are presently in. Um, Harvard Business School this year made the decision to write a case study. And Harvard Business School, the bastion of capitalism, decided to write a case study and teach it as a mandatory content, teach it as mandatory content to 900 of its first year students. Mm. And the case study is about Tulsa, Oklahoma and the massacre oh, wow. of black owned businesses in Tulsa. And you know the story about Tulsa having 10,000 black people and 600 black owned businesses, that's a 15 to one ratio of residents to businesses, very close to what the ratio is today of in America with Americans to number of businesses. And what that represents is a very healthy community financially. Everybody in Tulsa, Oklahoma wasn't rich, but they were doing well because we had all of their private enterprise in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we know that Tulsa was attacked by whites who were jealous. They burned down all of the businesses. And Harvard Business School teaches this case study now as a part of their discussion about reparations. And fascinatingly enough, um, I was stunned to hear that a large majority of the students after reading the case study, and we know this, most whites have never heard of what happened in Tulsa, um, had never heard of it before. We just got the 100 year celebration and we saw four or five different documentaries of it. But prior to that, most whites had never heard of what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And most of the white students um, at the business school had. And so, but, this, but with that information now, most of them voted that reparations should be given to the mm. residents and the descendants of the folks in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I believe that Black history should be a part of the teachings that have to do with finance so that whites understand and ideally become more empathetic to what has happened to Blacks. And I also believe that, for example, financial literacy is important to Blacks as well because we have been denied this education. Um, and part of the reason we are denied the education is because we don't have any money. And um, mm -hmm. so therefore, my recommendations in terms of including financial literacy, I believe that the reparations that Black people get should be accompanied by a requirement that every Black person takes one class. I don't want to inundate Black people with a multiple, multi, a need to, to attend weeks and weeks of class, just one class on personal finance management. Okay. And I think a class on personal financial management is good for the Black community, is good for every community. We see it in other places. And not only, Alexi, do we see it on the part of individuals, the reality is this is a very common request on the part of people who want to be entrepreneurs, and that is financial literacy courses. Um, when entrepreneurs are asked, and I teach entrepreneurial finance, most entrepreneurs fail. And when they're asked, why did you fail? Most of them say it was because of lack of training. Then they're mm -hmm. asked, where is the area that you had the least training? And the area and the response is finance. Then they were asked, where do you spend most of your time? And the answer was finance. So you saw this sort of disconnect with business people as well as, as we're pointing out, with, um, with uh, private individuals as well. I'll close with this, and that is, one of the best demonstrated practice of financial literacy being a part of the education of Black people at the earliest stages, literally going starting in kindergarten and first grade, is a Ooh. school in Chicago called REL Academy, okay. A-R-I-E-L. In REL Academy, the founders are John Rogers Jr., not related to me, and Melody Hobson. They're the CEOs of REL Investments. They're two young Black men and women who went to Princeton University. John Rogers founded REL Investments. It is an asset management firm with uh, over uh, $4 billion of assets under management. But John used part of his monies um, to found this academy in an all black, low income community. And the school caters to black children who come from primarily impoverished households, but they're being taught the fundamentals of finance when they come into first grade. REL Academy, its entire focus is on financial comprehension and teaching the students about finance um, beginning in first grade, 
and also teaching them by the, pr the practicum that has been implemented where each one of them actually receives money to buy stocks that they can invest in during their eight years of time at the school. And if they have a surplus by the time they get to the eighth grade, they take that capital actually with them. But they're mm. taught the fundamentals. So I'm a strong proponent of this whole idea of teaching it uh, finance, and I believe it, it should be taught in every Black community throughout the country. Thank you. And it sounds as if you're advocating for it to be taught sooner than the freshman year or the first year experience within undergraduate. Absolutely. And, you know, we need, the Black community needs to be, needs to emulate the white community relative to being exposed to this much earlier than one gets into high school. And when you tend to come from a, a family of affluence, you actually become familiar and it becomes a part of your world much earlier in life. We need that to happen to Black folks as well. That the teaching, and we know it from John's work and it's anecdotal in the sense that it's only one school, but we know that we, you can begin teaching financial literacy as early as first grade. Mm, mm hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And so I have one last question for you. Thank you um, for the conversation thus far. In your sure. interview um, with our Toward Inclusive Excellence blog, Stephen, you had given a charge to academic libraries to secure copies of your book and to display it prominently. And so, of course, you know, many of my colleagues took your charge to heart. Yet many more contacted me to ask you for some ideas or tips on what more the academic library community can do to raise awareness about so many of the topics that you've explored in your book. I have three things, Alexi. I love this question. Absolutely love it. The first thing I would recommend is that, that they reach out to me, that I am available to do interviews, book interviews, and that they host the session. Um, at their school, at the library, uh, um, uh, the, you know, I know Harvard has one, for example, called Book Talk. One is, so I recommend something like that, where they're hosting an author's interview or something like that, and I'd be more than amenable and willing to participate. The second thing I would recommend is something similar to what happened to me when I was a professor at Harvard Business School with my course, Black Business Leaders and Entrepreneurship. My students were required to identify an absence of a business in the Black community, that they could create this business to help and provide a product or service to the mm -hmm. Black community. And the librarians at Baker Library at Harvard Business School heard about it, and they reached out to me. And they said, we'd like to be a resource to your students with looking for data and information for their business plans that they're going to write but we like to help them in terms of their research. So when they reached out to me, I responded and said, thank you, thank you, thank you, please. And they came to my class every time I had the class and they made presentations on the resources that are available to my students on the topic of black businesses, black uh, uh, areas where black services are needed, data regarding the black community and spending patterns. They came to my community, excuse me, to my class, armed with this information and told students, when you come to the library, we will actually direct you to all of this information. If you send us information in advance, we will hmm. prepare the information, have it waiting for you and everything. So with that, not only did they come to my class at the beginning of the class to make a presentation, then we had my class, my students go to the library so that the librarians could actually give a presentation to them in their own house, in their own library, telling them where resources were, how to access those resources. So I would say to all librarians out there, all people in the library industry, reach out to professors in your school who may be, uh, have included topics about Blacks in business, Black banks or anything like that, but reach out to them or reach out to the entire faculty population, making them aware that you are available to support them, especially on any topics that has to do with Blacks and specifically the topics, for example, that I raised in my book. The last one I would recommend is that I believe every library 
should, for example, during the month of February, Black History Month, and they don't have to wait until then. But my book has four recommendations for whites. One recommendation deals with making donations to historically Black colleges and universities. And I ask people to donate 9.29% of their annual philanthropic dollars to HBCUs um, because HBCUs, um, they have $12 million on average of endowments. They're, they're poor schools financially, but they're doing Herculean jobs. We know today that over 80% of all Black judges come from HBCUs, 50% of Black lawyers. So I'm asking people to support uh, historically Black colleges and universities. There's 101 of them. I think a librarian should devote a week to um, black historically Black colleges and mm, their importance. Mm -hmm. um, I also give a recommendation in the book that, that, that I ask whites to spend at least 9.29% of their annual budget with Black-owned businesses. And 9.29% represents the nine minutes and 29 seconds that Officer Chauvin hit his knee on George Floyd's neck. Mm -hmm. um, but, mm -hmm. And I believe that, and the reason for that is because Black-owned businesses are the largest employer of Black people, private employer of Black people in the country. I believe a week should be devoted by the library to Black businesses, the history of Black businesses, the relevance of them today. The third one is that Black-owned banks, that I ask people to um, deposit um, at least 9.29% of their annual savings in a Black-owned bank and leave it there uh, for three to five years because Black-owned banks have always gotten money from uh, Black people. And Black people, as I've stated repeatedly, we're an impoverished group of people. So people put money uh, in banks uh, and they take it out because they need that money for day-to-day -day living. And so the banks don't have the benefit of what we call the money multiplier, where banks can actually create new money by getting deposits that stay there. And the money multiplier works like this. And that is you open a bank account, Alexi, and uh, you put $100 in the bank. The bank takes 10 of those dollars and holds it. And they do what's called fractional lending. Then they loan me $90. I take those $90 and I put them in another bank account. So from, one, from your $100, we've just created $190, but we've just created another $90. Black mm. banks don't have that benefit because they get money from people who can't leave the money there. So I believe libraries should do one week devoted to the history of Black banks and importance of Black banks. And then finally, just like Harvard Business School has devoted their first case, one of their first cases for the students coming into school as a first year student to the topic of reparations, I think a week should be devoted to the topic of reparations. So that would be my recommendations right there. Well, thank you. And thank you, Stephen, so much for this really enlightening conversation. So everyone, we just wrapped up a really fantastic dialogue with Stephen S. Rogers, who is author of A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues, What You Can Do Right Now to Help the Black Community. It was just released this year on Wiley. Stephen, thank you so much again for your time today. Alexi, thank you very much. And it was just released on last month. Um, it was released on George Floyd's um, the anniversary of his, his murder. Wow. Wow. And let me close with this statement. And that is just very simply, I'm reaching out to those white people who have a kind heart and who have a logical mind. And if you read the book, you'll see that the book is chock full of facts, data, as well as anecdotes and stories. So it's more than just simply a letter. The objective yes. of the book is to teach and ideally to teach such that one becomes more empathetic to the realities of what has happened to Black people in America, and that the readers, therefore, will become action-oriented and decide to take some action to address this great problem that we have. Excellent. Stephen, thank you so much again. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Alexa. You're the absolute best. <laughs> thank you. I do try. This was an excellent summer session, a great way to kick us off. So thank you so much again. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to our Toward Inclusive Excellence Summer Session podcast with Stephen S. Rogers, author of A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues, What You Can Do Right Now to Help the Black Community. Sign up for reminders of new content releases 
and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your time and support and please be safe. Mine will drift away.